Hi everybody, welcome back to CDO IQ in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You're watching theCUBE's continuous coverage. We're wrapping up day one. We're here with Peter Aiken, who's the president of, of DEMA International. Peter, good to see you again. Thanks Absolutely. so much for having us back here. And uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE, making some time for us. We're always glad to talk to you guys, Dave. So how's it going for you? Let's, we haven't caught up in a while. But let's, let's, uh, what's new? Let's, well, I think let's the tell last us about DEMA International. And, What's going on at uh, CDO IQ this year for you? You said the last time we chatted was a couple years ago, and look <laughs> how big it's grown since yeah, then. Amazing, right? And so uh, just, uh, we're seeing this stuff snowball, and it's wonderful. There's so much more interest in data, there's so much more interest in data leadership, which is really the piece that we're looking at. And trying to figure out you know, how to crack this uh, particular puzzle. I mean, you've seen there's a couple sessions around that are focused in on uh, you know, data leadership topics and why us introverted data people, how we can become leaders, which is not an easy task. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that's coming out of this though, I think, is that we're seeing that data leadership is really much more about the transferable skills. We used to call them soft skills, but they're transferable skills now. It sounds a whole lot better that way. And a lot less about the technology. And I think you're going to see that as a continuing trend around this. Well, I mean, one of the themes of the discussions we've had from, we had Mario Faria on earlier, and Sanjeev Mohan and I were speaking, and Sanjeev's highly technical, of course, so he comes at it from a technical angle, but culture, a data culture, establishing a data culture, uh, and that's about people, you know, it's certainly about process, uh, but that's really where it starts, and that's where leadership comes in. H how, how are you seeing the leaders here establish cultures in a way uh, that are sustainable and durable? I think it goes really to a core concept, which is data literacy. Uh, in the past, we've looked at it as somewhat of an academic topic, where you know, us academics are asking how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin, and that's interesting, but probably not going to move the needle. Instead, I think the focus is, if we can make everybody in the organization, all of our knowledge workers, more data literate, they're also going to then be encouraged to become more active, more involved, ask questions, really even kick the tires a little bit on some of the topics we're looking at. So data literacy, I, I, I want to dig into that a little bit and understand what that's, that means. I'm, I'm the joke of my family, because I'm always about, what's the data say? And they're like, oh boy, here he goes. But it's, I, I love data, you know, and I love trying to interpret data and trying to figure out where my interpretation is wrong and because you know, it's not always right and <laughs> so, so many data sources. So what does it mean to be data literate? Well, there's an official definition out there which is the ability to read, write, and argue with data. And unfortunately, that doesn't mean anything to most people. That's uh, the official definition, they they tell a story with data. Right? Wikipedia, exactly. Yeah, okay. and, and, you know, good definition. But I think when most people are doing that, they're saying, what do you mean argue with data? And so what it really comes down to is saying, I'm in command of some facts that are actually agreed upon and that we can use. Now, unfortunately, this immediately moves us into fake news and all that sort of talk. Disraeli. Exactly, <laughs> Disraeli, perfect, right? Um, I heard a great story last night at dinner, though, which is one of the wonderful things that happens at these events. There was an economist in the Treasury Department that actually helped change the course of World War II with data. Really? Yeah, that's, that's what I said, right? Tell me that story. So the Americans are bombing during the day, this is Germany of course, and the British are bombing at night, and nothing much is happening. We're not moving any needles. There's still really good production of planes and bombs. So an economist from the Treasury Department went over and talked to the folks at the war machine and said, the real key short pole in the tent here is the pilots. And we immediately changed our tactics to be the, the bombers are going over as a decoy. Germans would send up their fighters to go after the bombers. We'd try and shoot down. If we shot down a couple hundred of their pilots, that put a crimp in their efforts because you, all the planes and all the bombs in the world don't do anything if you don't have the pilots to do them. That's a use of data that was super impressive, not told, and again, who would have thought an economist would have had a difference so in the war there? So they changed the strategy because of data, <laughs> and the outcome was obviously successful. Yay for us, right? That's, that's really interesting. Um, so you mentioned earlier the, the, the growth of this conference. To what do you attribute that? Is it just sort of the AI is so hot now? Is it just the realization that you, you, you can't have a, a strategy, let alone a data, uh, an AI strategy without quality data? Think about what's going into AI, data, right? You know this, I don't need to tell you. My license plate back in Virginia is G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Got it, nobody else in the state has it, so. 
it's the same thing with AI. If you've got an AI that's out there, even just ChatGPT, and by the way, we're forcing ChatGPT to be used in our classrooms now. Might as well get ahead of the curve and, and use it that way. Students are getting really good with this stuff. It's amazing some of the things they're putting down. But it's a B student right at the moment. So ChatGPT, if we had graded it, we'd give them a, a B, 85. It's pretty good. That's pretty good. On the other hand, where does that data go? It goes back out on the internet as being generated. And now you're talking about a 15% continuous compounding rate. There's one prediction out there that said that most of the world's web data will be generated by the year 2026 or 2027. And if 15% of it is an error and it's used to generate the rest, we got a problem. Yes, yeah, so you're going to have a degra degradation of the models, if you will, the outputs of the models. Which unfortunately hurts credibility all the way around. So now we're back to the sort of chicken and egg situation. Hmm. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out again. It's like if you're teaching kids crap, <laughs> it's, it's going to deteriorate. So instead of having students turn in the answers, what we're asking them to do is to turn in a lab notebook that shows their thought process. And they like that because they understand there is no right or wrong answer given that sort of thing. But if they can show how they got to a certain place, I had a kid come up with some really unique things, doing some data mining and some really interesting financial transactions. And this is like for a boring government financial data application, but man, that's an exciting, you know, really exciting breakthrough. There are, but there are a lot of stories about professors that basically outlaw the use of ChatGPT or any large language model, which, I mean, I, I bristle at that. That's how I remember people said, you know, teachers said you couldn't use Wikipedia. It's like, How'd huh. that work? <laughs> but I could use encyclopedias, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so that's interesting to me that you're embracing it. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, there's so many uses, there's infinite number of use cases. I mean, e even to something as simple as fact checking, um, which you better be careful. <laughs> so if you can document your process, right, and, and actually show how you leverage the technology, that's a skill. That yes. You're teaching, if I understand it. Yeah, and, and it's the one that's going to carry forward to create economic value. It's going to be with us going forward. We might as well learn how to embrace it. Yeah. <laughs> so why then do you think so many folks in the field, um, are, gonna, are they in the denial? Are they just afraid that people are going to be cheating? I mean, they're just cheating themselves. So, but uh, Let me take your question slightly differently. So I, I do a lot of chatting with my folks out in the DEMA community and always ask them, are your companies letting you use GPT, encouraging you to use it or not? And I was in Phoenix, Arizona, which has a lot of insurance and uh, finance thing, and I did a big meeting with them. And interestingly enough, they were the first group I've seen where they all raised their hand and said, yes, we're being encouraged to use it. Almost everywhere else, people are like, no, they do not want us to use it because they're afraid that they're going to put the company jewels into those questions and then it'll be out there on the internet. Now that's an interesting problem. But what's happening, of course, when they're prohibited from doing that, they pull their device out of yeah, their pocket of and sit yeah. down and use it that way because they know that's possible and powerful in order to use it. I think the sooner we embrace it, the better off we'll be, but there is an intellectual property protection issue that we have to worry about. Yeah, because then if you're embracing, what goes along with that is a training regimen uh, that is educational, um, and that, that in it itself creates some guardrails, whereas you, you can't adjudicate this, right? I mean, I know specific situations of cases where ChatGPT's outlawed in terms of code generation this is exactly what they do. And when you talk to developers, you say, yeah, it, I like ChatGPT, it's better for this use case. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to use the, the, the one that's dictated, I'm going to use my phone. And so you're seeing a lot of companies that are building their own versions of it and keeping it internal, and that, that does make sense. But it also limits your ability to go anywhere beyond it and to keep current. Are you seeing um, this idea of small language models being applied in specific domain instances, uh, you know, the long tail and the power law, if you will, um, it's certainly talked about um, are you seeing more and more examples of that that are interesting to you? I'm seeing lots of uses of it. I'm not sure about the success rate. I think mm -hmm. that's still a question to be determined. Uh, but remember, you know, you've been in this business a long time. Remember when cloud was free? Yeah. <laughs> the number one issue with CEOs today is, my damn bill in cloud is way too expensive and I want you guys to get this under control. Yeah. What a turnaround in just five years. 
I think we're going to see the same kind of thing. It's not going to be a cost issue, but it's going to be the same kind of, we need to understand how to manage this properly in order to get it to work right for us. You know, that's interesting, and, and you hear a lot of talk about repatriation, almost in the context of cloud is bad, but what actually happened is that, that traditional IT was so inefficient, mm -hmm. and then the cloud was able to create pretty high margins, right, and then also create new value and new acceleration, and then sort of democratize, the, turn the data center into an API, mm -hmm. and so you had this sort of, the step function reduction in cost, Correct. which has led to this just this, massive use, which then people say, wait a minute, let's attack that problem, All right, and you're probably going to see the same thing with LLMs. I think so. <laughs> and I don't think anybody that I've seen has cracked the issue, but I think there's an, there's an answer there. Where do you land on the commoditization of LLMs? There's a big discussion around that LLMs we com commoditize, others say no, no, they won't, the innovation will continue. I They're think like clouds, we'll see variations. Right, there'll probably be sort of some general things. People will be a Gemini client or a ChatGPT client or a auto, what's Microsoft's Copilot uh, version of it. You know, those will be interesting. Um, I talked to somebody here who is convinced that uh, Microsoft has made a big bet and they're scared whether it's going to come through or not because of what Apple's done with the on-device stuff. You know, once again, do you feel more comfortable with ChatGPT knowing this stuff or ChatGPT knowing it on your device? Yeah. In which case, you're probably a little more comfortable. Yeah, competition is a wonderful thing. It is, it keeps <laughs> driving things. On the other hand, it's probably we need more than two of them out there, so. Yeah, so hopefully the innovation continues, although, oh well, you know, it's interesting, the other conversation everybody's having is that, uh, is this a dot-com-like bubble and, and, and what are the similarities and differences between 99 and, and today? And, a big difference is you've got huge cloud companies funding this build out off of their balance sheets right. as opposed to your global crossing taking out debt or Enron you know, creating you know, what it does. What do you see as the, the sort of where we're at in this bubble or not? So um, I read this morning that it's not a bubble, it's an air pocket. Okay. Sure, right, exactly. <laughs> um, Amy Webb, who I think you know, yeah. uh, had a really wonderful book a couple of years ago that said if you weren't with one of these nine companies, what your AI was was a toy. And certainly toys are interesting and it's where innovation's going to come from, but the real big stuff is I think where we're going to see things happen. Uh, I haven't seen much coming out of the toys that is really interesting other than really innovative stuff that's nascent at the moment, but if they nurture it correctly, we're going to see a whole lot of things happen in that area. I, 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 I talked to a number of banks when I visit New York, and, and one in particular is aggressively building its own LLM. Mm -hmm. They're actually bringing in a semiconductor firm to They're help them. Fantastic. Which I find quite interesting. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I remember banks telling me they were going to build their own cloud because they could do it better. And some of them have. Yeah. But not most. Yeah, many of them now using the public cloud. Um, it mix, but so you, your reaction to that, so I get mixed reactions when I tell the, yeah. the, the story. So well, if, why if, you if, you get a, if you get it your own chipset and things, and that may be one of the plays that they're looking at, is it think if you had something on the chip that actually you know, kept security going at yep. the, the high pace. That actually would be an opportunity for the bank to then say, hey, we can leverage both public and private types of activities and learn where the balance is in there. But if you're still stuck on chips where you don't know what's inside them, you know, there's just another whole question as well. And Remember, most of them were made in China. And it was, <laughs> it was interesting, <laughs> including Taiwan in that mm -hmm, equation, mm -hmm. I presume. So it was interesting because when I probed, they, would, they, would, they didn't trust open source. Right and the, the fine print in, in open source. And, but and, I think we're beyond that now, don't you? Uh, except Llama, it's not Apache 2, right? That right? doesn't so have the track it, record. It does say, if you get big enough, we can come back and yeah. hold our hands. And that's a problem. Uh, so, you know, that's presumably what Meta's going to do with Apple. Yep. <laughs> right? So, that, that kind of uncertainty is leading them to say, you know what, we'll just build our own. Right because we, we have we control, can. yeah, or, or at least think we have control, whether they do or not, it's another. But you know, you've got more ability to control it if it's internal than you do if it's on the 
Yeah, on the general place. So, so um, what else is exciting you these days? Really, I, I think the, the, the things that are most exciting at the moment is the vibrancy. We're starting to bring younger people into this. Now, in China, I've made two trips so far this year to China. And in China, they have a joke that says, if you're gray hair or no hair, you're in data. <laughs> and, you know, probably not the best joke, but you know, they told it to me. So, But it's kind of true. It is kind of true. Yeah. And it, we've also observed in DEMA that it's about a 15-year journey. So somebody is in IT, they're working hard, they're seeing some failures, they're looking at the failures and saying, oh, it's the data, you know, the second failure occurs. Somebody says, you've said data three times, now you're the data person. <laughs> And then they start and they look around and they find Dama International and say, ah, oh, there's my peeps. I can now start to get into this thing. That's a 15 year de delay in productivity. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to move this down. We're trying to get things into high school, college. I mean, college curriculum is still basically the same one we did 30 years ago. That's just not good in today's environment. But we are getting students that are wandering into my office and saying, I want a career in data. I think it's a really cool thing. And if you look around here, I think the average age of this conference has dropped considerably, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So beyond reading, writing arithmetic into more diverse. Data literacy. If you're a knowledge worker, you're working with data, right? Yeah, good. Peter, it's great to see you again. Thanks so much for Always coming back to theCUBE. Thank you. And uh, appreciate again, you guys having us here. It's, it's, it's good to be back. At, uh, CDO IQ. Always glad to see you. All right, this is a wrap on day one. Uh, we're we're going to launch into tomorrow. We've got a full day. Paul Gillen will be here. Uh, Sanjeev Mohan will also be back. I'm Dave Vellante, and you're watching theCUBE at CDO IQ 2024. See you tomorrow.